Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Washington, D.C. and the Marriott Marquis. Hope you got a chance to get some food, because we have an exciting program in store for you tonight. My name is Peter Humphrey, uh, and I am joined by my esteemed colleagues here on stage, friends, and my community. Thank you very much all for being here. So before uh, we kind of get started in earnest with the good stuff, uh, just a couple housekeeping announcements. And of course, we have to say thank you to our sponsors real quick. Our platinum sponsor, Pivotal. Uh, our gold sponsors, OCI Web, who have now picked up the Grails team. Let's give a round of applause for them. Yeah. <laughs> VMware, Software AG, also gold sponsors. And we actually have kind of a long roll of gold sponsors this year. Uh, App Dynamics, Broadleaf Commerce, Crafter Software, Hazelcast, JetBrains, JFrog. Yeah, can I get a shout out for Baruch? <laughs> New Relic, uh, one of the main marketing ladies, uh, Tamau, who used to run this conference, now works at New Relic, and I hope she's here. Um, New NTT Data. Target Incorporated, yes, the target you're thinking of, or as we call it, Target. Zero Turnaround, and uh, a few others. Um, so just to get started, I want to let you guys know there's nine breakout rooms, OK? Five of those are the Spring One tracks. Four of those are the Groovy and Grails tracks. Uh, they are all located on M4. Uh, that is two levels below us. Apparently, nothing in DC can be higher than the Washington Monument, so they dug down. Right. <laughs> um, so please take a minute to walk around the, uh, the hotel and familiarize yourself with the layout, OK? Uh, then it won't be you, know, you running around to try to catch sessions. Hey, where am I going? But really, pretty much all the sessions are on this level, so we tried to make it easy for you. Now, if you like the sessions that you attend tonight, please tweet your love, tweet your appreciation to hashtag S2GX. Hopefully, that's not too hard to remember. But if it is, it's posted on the signage all over the place. Uh, all the meals are going to be. Well, right here. So that's easy. Uh, all the sessions start at 8.30 AM, promptly in the morning. And let's have a quick audience poll. Who likes fast wireless at, at conferences? Yes. OK. Who likes to have wireless work at conferences? Yeah. OK. So that means if you have five devices, please just connect to one of them at a time. Just one device at a time, OK? That'll really help with, with bandwidth. Um, the uh, SSID is just Spring12GX, and the password is S2GX. Uh, for the event schedule, uh, the website has basically got the event schedule. It's responsive, so you can look at it on your mobile or your tablet. Uh, if you don't feel like that, you can always go visit one of the big poster boards um, in the M4. Uh, that's this level in the foyer, foyer outside. Or there's also some big posters uh, up on M2 that have the schedule. Uh, there's also a passport game this year. So if you pick up the passport and get uh, 16 stamps from 14 sponsors, uh, we've got a couple extra demos that give you stamps in the Pivotal Lounge, um, then you can turn that in for the awesome track jacket. OK? Uh, so you can just pick that up and uh, yours to keep, um, as well as uh, actually the conference t-shirt. Um, sponsors are giving away cool prizes at the Wednesday lunch. So you have to be there to win. Uh, excuse me. Yeah, the Wednesday lunch. Um, so you have to be there to win. Um, and they will pick the drawings. Um, uh, we'll pick the drawings up from right on stage from all the booth scans. So another good reason to go visit your sponsors is uh, you may get one of the cool prizes. And they have some good stuff. So um, this is my personal favorite part, instant access to the session recordings. So I say instant in quotes. It does take us a little while to render the audio and the video. but. You'll get a unique access code uh, sent to you Tuesday morning um, in the, in, with the email you use to register for the conference. So that is a one-time use code. And that will give you access to uh, the session recordings as they are rendered and posted to the website. We'll probably have a few of them, like the keynotes and some of the early sessions, up as early as Tuesday evening. And then we'll just continue rolling and publishing them on the InfoQ website. The URL will be in the email, so you don't need to worry about any of the details. But just realize that you're going to get an email with a code in it that will help you get access to the session recordings. So if you're thinking about scheduling, what you want to attend, 
just realize that you don't have to miss anything. OK? All right, great. So uh, yeah, and if you lose or forget your code, you can uh, go to the information desk uh, and, and get that back. Um, if you get a little tired during the day, you need a break, come by, visit us at the Pivotal Lounge. We're going to have lots of engineers uh, hanging around and uh, sh you know, well, willing to talk to you, show demonstrations, uh, and just conversate. So uh, please come by and visit us. We'd love to talk to you. Uh, last thing, uh, this year, a new thing, pancake breakfast with the new stack. Anyone read the new stack online? Just curious. Show of hands. New stack, good publication. You guys should check it out. Um, so we're going to do a podcast and pancakes live right here on stage during breakfast uh, tomorrow morning, starting at 7.30. Um, James Waters. Uh, we're also going to have some speakers from Netflix. Uh, and we're going to have uh, Guillaume LaForge, uh, the head of the Groovy Project. Uh, and Graham Rocher from the Grails project. So uh, that'll be available for you uh, while you're having your breakfast. And come have a short stack with the new stack. So um, after the keynote, right after that's done, um, we're going to have a short announcement from Target, who is sponsoring the drinks and appetizers uh, out in the foyer immediately following the keynote. So uh, don't run away immediately once we're done. Um, but you can grab a specific mixed drink called a Target Teeny. I don't really know what's in it, but once you guys find out, please let me know and let me know if it's good, because it sounds like I might want one. Um, the event survey also. This is a really important one, folks. Um, you've traveled all the way here. You're going to a lot of sessions. We're going to do an event survey and speaker surveys online. Uh, those questions and that will start to become available very late tonight. <laughs> um, so. Uh, um, please, you know, when you're done with your sessions, uh, feel free to log into the Spring 1-2GX site and tell the speakers how they did. They would really appreciate your feedback. Um, you know, it helps us prioritize. It helps us get better. Um, so tell us what you think of the event. I know a lot of you in here probably aren't shy. I just, we just want to remind you to, to actually do it. And we'll give you a gift uh, for, for doing that as well. Come again. Yeah, better speakers and content next year, basically. So the more you fill out the surveys, the better we get. So please remember that. OK, um, that's it. On with the show. Thank you guys so much for coming. We're really excited that you're here. We just uh, broke about 1,000 attendees. So really excited about that. We got a big crowd tonight. <laughs> and so with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, James Waters. James, would you come up to the stage, sir? Thanks, Peter. Great intro. I, uh, I love that we have a live coding demo up next. So I'm the person that's standing between you and awesome live coding. Um, so I'll try to go through this pretty quickly, because I'm actually just as excited to be an audience at this conference as I am to say anything. Um, DevOps. DevOps. Yeah, right, right, right here. Uh, so who am, who am I? Uh, my name is James Waters, and I'm the general manager of the cloud uh, platform group at Pivotal. And I'm one of the luckiest individuals on Earth because I have around 300 R&D people that are absolutely fantastically brilliant and creative, working on next generation problems every day. And I pretty much pinch myself every day when I wake up, and I realize that that's the group that I'm a part of, and I'm incredibly proud of that. So that's who I am. And uh, I was just going to talk a little bit about you know, the journey that it's been for me, about a 15-year career starting in, you know, the late 90s, uh, to this sort of cloud movement that we've got, the kind of technologies that we use today, and reflect on that a little bit, because I think it's a really big deal what's happening in 2015. And I'm going to do my best to articulate to you as an audience kind of some of my perspective on that and some of the learnings I've, you know, gotten from hanging out with a lot of different customers and developers around the world. <clears throat> I was thinking back to my very first day at Sun Microsystems because i have been a network engineer at a company called Level 3, and I always used SunTech and Java, and I was always wanted to work across the street in Broomfield. And I would drive by Sun every day, and I was super pumped. And I finally got a job there, and it's my first day, and they send me out. They're like, OK, you're going to go immerse with this customer and what's going on there. And I was like, OK, let's do this. I'm going to go get immersed. And they're like, the first thing we have to do is do a six-week assessment for server sizing for the app. And I said, that's what we do. We assess how big the server needs to be for six weeks. And I was thinking about that first day as we get into this sort of next generation of continuous delivery and microservices and cloud enablement and laughing 
at my former self and the world that we lived in of like once every year or half a year deployment and how different 2015 feels to me in terms of a brand new generation of enterprise tech and the way that we really think about software and software infrastructure. Um, and I wanted to share at the start of this some of the signals that we started to get in uh, 2015. Josh Long and I were having coffee down in LA, and what was the, what did we say to each other? We'll never forget the summer of 2015, right? Never. Just, just can't forget it. And so here's some of the signals that, that started happening. So in April, <coughs> Brian Dussault was doing a little bit of a review of all of the R&D planning of the entire company, and this was one slide out of about 70. And I was going through it, and at the time, Spring Boot had hit 1.2 million downloads uh, when, I, when I first read it. And I thought, hey, Brian, we have a brand new product that's got over a million downloads a month, and this hasn't been mentioned so far. Uh, note to self. And, I, and I, I'd already started feeling a little bit of the impact of Spring Boot, but it's absolutely become a phenomenon. Every customer I talk to, whether it's I went and visited Disney, oh, we're using Spring Boot. I went and visited Sony for Spring Boot. I was at Experian and Spring Boot, and you know, with Citigroup and it's Spring Boot. I'm at Ford and they're using Spring Boot. And so everywhere I go right now, Spring Boot is having an incredible impact. And what's so cool about that is it's a little viral bulldozer is how I, was my nickname for it, which is it's viral in that it gives developers a quick endorphin hit of ease of use and just uh, unparalleled grace of moving and um, packaging their application for deployment. But it's also a bulldozer because it changes the way the enterprises they work at think about deployment and configuration of that app. And so suddenly at this large auto manufacturing company, these developers were very empowered to move very quickly with boot. And you know, the traditional WebSphere team was there saying, oh no, 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 you gotta stop this boot nonsense. We wanna hand configure and hand tool this thing. And we wanna slow this down. And the developers were like, no dude, we're calling Pivotal. <laughs> and what happened was they put up a little flag to us and we land there with Cloud Foundry and we're like, this is that platform for running Spring Boot apps. And we moved 40 of those Spring Boot apps that already written to Cloud Foundry in an afternoon with Ben Hale. And there's this beautiful long email from him of how everything just worked together and it was sort of a fantastic moment to watch this little viral bulldozer that we have changing the way enterprises deliver code. And this code was not just some little side app. This was the global configuration engine for the entire car company, for every car that's ordered in the world, and how that company works. So Spring Boot is an absolute phenomena, and I, you know, it's now at 1.7 million downloads a month, and I have no idea where this party ends, but I'm enjoying it. The other great thing that's happening is, is that Cloud Foundry, as a cloud-native platform, has absolutely surpassed expectations in terms of enterprise adoption. And so more and more of these developers that want to use a microservices cloud native approach are finding a Cloud Foundry instance to use and consume inside you know, the enterprise that they work at. And the great thing as somebody who has to fund a very large R&D team is that we got to a $100 million booking rate in only six quarters. No one has stopped me from hiring anybody in months. Like I don't even write approval emails anymore. It's just as we find great people, we hire them on the team. And so it's really incredible to put that little viral bulldozer of Spring Boot together with this really great enterprise product that we have in Cloud Foundry. And it really gives me huge hope that this is a, a brand new generation. I look forward to the demos that we're doing of these two things together. So what's kind of happening out there? Like, why is this happening? <clears throat> About, you know, 2010, Mark Andreessen said software's eating the world, and that's when, you know, Andreessen's IQ could pick it up. The good news is, is that it, that trend is now so obvious that even Gartner's got it. And, uh, <laughs> sorry. Zing. <laughs> you know, as a, as a developer, um, it's a little less exciting for me to buy PeopleSoft off-the-shelf software and rack and stack servers and run that and turn it on. And so there's two big trends that are happening is that all the business owners in the world are realizing that those apps they might have written in the 2000s aren't really going to scale to this mobile connected world that we have that's data intensive and experience intensive. And so one of the top five priorities that Gartner has mentioned is that every major company wants to refactor those apps. And that's such an enormous opportunity for this room because you're the most important people in the world. Um, the business leaders that I meet are desperate for refactored apps and delivering new experiences. And they all really want to know where are these mythical cloud native developers that I keep mentioning. So this room is going to be one of the most in-demand rooms in the world, and I'm going to spend my life on planes making sure that's the case. 
Um, but I'm very excited about that, combined with the second point here, which is that businesses really want to start building applications, not buying them. Because if you think about how companies digitally differentiate themselves these days, it's not from buying you know, Salesforce or PeopleSoft or any of the off-the-shelf software anymore. The age of hand-created and custom-developed software is getting even stronger and bigger. <clears throat> and so what they ask me, typically, is help us transform. Help, help us get from there to the, here to there. How do we become this digitally enabled enterprise, cloud native enterprise? And they feel upside down. So this is another Gartner slide, which means it's really painfully obvious by now in the market, um, is that most people really want to transform how much it costs them to operate their legacy versus how much innovative new things they can do. And I had this fascinating conversation with one of the top three banks in the world. And I went really deep all day with them, and we talked about their pain. They said, we have 6,800 applications that we're trying to run right now. And we originally tried to do generic automation. Um, and what happened was every app had a different way that it ran, a different way that it did service discovery, a different way it managed itself. And they created 6,200 snowflakes. And there was sort of this pregnant pause, and I slid Matt Stein's book, Migrate into Cloud Native Applications, right across the table. I literally I went into my backpack, and I pulled out that book, and I slid it across the table to the head of the bank. And I said, you have an application problem. Um, and they just pounded their hands on the table. I won't forget it, because when you get that emotional response out of people, like, they almost get a little bit animalistic about how passionate they are in this. And the woman who was the chief architect says, yes, I have an application problem. And so right now, we're working with this bank. They, they've looked at Matt's book, and they've looked at this idea of cloud-native applications, and they've given us a proposal to recraft the entire bank based on that architecture. So this is what's happening in the market right now, is that people are realizing it's really about cloud-native apps. And it starts with 12-factor. Uh, a lot of folks start with you know, Heroku's manifesto of 12-factor applications, writing things that are built to be deployed in a SaaS software style. There's a lot of great learnings in 12-factor. But 12-factor leaves a lot left to complete. And so this is really what's happening in 2015 at Pivotal, is that we've brought together a cloud-native platform and cloud foundry where you can run your code. But we've gone much further and deeper than that. It's not just merely a basic deployment engine. Um, what we've done with Spring Boot and the way that we've done uh, simplified deployment and configuration for deployment is incredible, and you saw the virality of that. And then over the top, and this is really where we're shocking the world right now, and where you know, Matt Stein and Josh Long can't stay off airplanes, is Spring Cloud gives them an out-of-the-box, ready, ready approach to doing this distributed coordination, service discovery, health management, circuit breakers, you know, even key management and secrets management is coming. And so this is really, really the state of the art of what you might call a microservices or cloud-native platform. Oh, sorry, I went forward. So that's, that's a huge conversation for us. And this is where I'm just as excited to be a participant at this conference and go to all the spring cloud sessions and see some of the code that's been developed by Mr. Sire, et cetera. But this is absolutely revolutionary to folks. And the reason it is is that once you get an application built this way, the reason the business loves it is it's much easier to deliver continuous microservices in that way, and it's much cheaper to operate them. So we really radically change the economics of both operations and delivery for the applications. So we're going to show you a little bit as soon as I'm done here, one of our teams working in a microservices delivery fashion with the platform, live coding, real time. And you can see the benefits of that. So this is industry changing stuff. And uh, I couldn't be more excited. And I think there's going to be incredible R&D done by this team over the next couple of years. Um, and we're just getting started. And I love these quotes that I get back, because it really is a unique moment in time in 2015 when people go, I can't believe you've gone the whole way from the operating system to like service discovery in the framework. This is an unparalleled story that you're telling in terms of a complete platform. People are very excited about that. Why would we go anyplace else? And so I think one of the important things we're doing is we are writing the book on it. So there's an education thing. It's great that you're here at Spring One to learn about these technologies. But we've got Matt Stein's book on cloud-native application migration. And I couldn't be more excited than uh, to introduce uh, you know, Kenny, who's a new evangelist for us, and his book on cloud-native Java that he's co-writing with uh, Josh Long. So these are really exciting things. And I think you're really going to see this room as the leader in this sort of cloud-native style of development that's going to be so impactful. And we're just getting started. So the great thing about this humming business that we have now helping transform all these companies is that we're able to fund new and interesting things. So you'll hear a little bit about the distributed tracing work that's coming out of Spring Sleuth. 
that I think is really exciting. Um, and uh, you'll see the Spring XD being migrated to be a cloud native application and uh, Spring Cloud Dataflow. So these are really, you know, more bold ambitions that we have in the future to capture every kind of development on the life cycle of the app. So I'll just finish up with a few things that this is attracting. Uh, and I love this picture, because this is what my office feels like every day. Um, <laughs> lots of people coming and going, and lots of energy. And so there's some other companies that have noticed what we've been up to. And so uh, Josh Long went over and spent some time with uh, the engineers at Alibaba, and uh, we got this quote from them this week. And they're going to be competing now with Amazon with using microservices to, uh, you know, continuously deliver their value, to operate them more affordably, all of the great scalability benefits. I mean, Josh had a great session with them, and now they're using uh, Spring Cloud and Spring Boot as the foundation of their new, their new properties. I think that's incredible that we've got such an enormous, large power user already in the ecosystem with Spring Cloud only a couple of months from GA. So that's, that's really incredible. Cognizant has... This, this blows my mind. 50,000 Java developers. So that's 50 of these rooms. Um, and they've seen in their customer base the rapid growth of the Spring Boot and Spring Cloud Tools Kit. And so Joe Tobolsky, who's here, I think somewhere in the back, maybe raise his hand. There he is. There's Joe from Chicago. He's working with Cognizant to start to build a cloud-native delivery factory. So some of this legacy problem that all these enterprises are having, they really want to build a center of excellence for cloud-native application transformation using the toolkit from this room in Spring One and Spring Cloud. And last but not least, we've got the world's largest payment company that has decided to revolutionize themselves from just being a payment backend company to being more API and developer-driven. First Data does over a trillion dollars a year of transactions. Um, if you ever go to a gas station, I almost guarantee you it was a First Data transaction. And they're going to work together with the Spring community to make everything they do integrated into Spring development um, and to refactor everything that they write on to be a cloud native app and Cloud Foundry. So this is just a quick sample of some of what I would call like so the pseudo-earth-shaking partnerships that are coming out of this R&D only a few months into what we've been up to. And there's a bunch of other names that are out there that I just, I just don't have permission to use their, uh, their logos and their quotes yet. But if you ever want to have a beer with me this week, I'll be happy to tell you all about them. <laughs> So we're really excited about our partnership with First Data and their new payment APIs. Um, and I'm just going to leave with uh, one simple thing, which is that uh, you know, we are Pivotal, and we are the cloud-native platform company. We've got an incredible set of assets, and I kid you not, we are hiring every day. Uh, we are building out a series of cloud-native architects. They're going to spend a lot of time with customers, helping them do some migrations and new applications. If you're interested in a job, come talk to me. Um, very interested in meeting folks. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Josh and his new business capability team to give a live demo. So Josh Long, who needs no introduction in the Sprint community. Oh, hi. <laughs> Before we, uh, thank you, James. Thanks. I think we should do one thing. Oh, hi. People, no, we, we have one matter we have to take care of before we can proceed on with this presentation. Let's do it. You know that, right? It has to happen. It's, <laughs> it's not really a thing uh, that we can talk about. So we need to take a, a Spring selfie. Now, can everybody in the room say Spring? <laughs> ah, money. Thanks, Thank Josh. you. Thanks, James. Woo! Thank you, James. <laughs> Hi, everybody. You guys are in for such a show. Such a show. Oh, yeah. Come on. All right. Good stuff. You are in for such a show. We have uh, a lot to talk about. Today, we're going to, in this presentation, in this keynote, we're going to uh, look at the uh, transition of a company from a monolithic ar application to a microservices architecture. Uh, with me today, I have the amazing Scott Frederick. Scott. <laughs> and of course, the good, the great, Dr. Sire, David Sire. Tomorrow I'll be joined by uh, the amazing Mark Fisher and uh, the amazing Graham Roche. So, you know, same springtime, same spring channel. Come on back. Today we're going to look at an existing application that we're trying to move from this monolithic architecture. And work is already underway, but we have some work we need to do. And so today I'm going to join Dr. Sire here, uh, and I'm going to join Scott Frederick, and we're going to see what it looks like to take these applications forward. Um, 
I've decided today that I want to talk to the doctor uh, about how to get... Whoa, whoa, wrong way around, man. <laughs> Awkward. We had a, I want to, I, I, I'm going to join the good doctor. That's not me. We're going to talk about moving this monolithic application that we had. Now, it's worth pointing out that the monolith that we had was, in the beginning, actually fairly, uh, you know, it was a good way to go. It defined the boundaries to tease out the, uh, the domain model. In the very beginning, the monolith was a, uh, an appropriate way to, to build the software. But now it's starting to gate our ability to deploy software faster. We're having trouble scaling the team because we spend a lot of time synchronizing code, synchronizing you know, deployments to production. So the monolith is starting to become a little heavy, and uh, the horse is it's dead, Jim. <laughs> it's dead. So we are going to look first at an application uh, for Rent Me Fleet. This application is a, an, a, an application that we can use to track the locations of a fleet of trucks, uh, as well as to see service locations. And uh, the first thing we need to do is to get the service location service, I think that's a great name, uh, up and running. And of course, to, to, for such a task, we need the doctor. We need my favorite doctor, the best doctor that I know. Uh, we've got to talk, we've got a few things running already, of course. We've got RabbitMQ, we've got MongoDB, we've got MySQL. Uh, we've got a service registry and a, uh, a stub application with sample data that's already deployed. And we have a user interface that was designed by the, by the UX team. This user interface is pretty. It's very, very well thought out, but it doesn't do anything yet. And so again, uh, in order to make this work, in order to, to really get it working, we need to look at the service location service. And I'm going to get help from the best doctor I know, the, the only doctor, the absolute best doctor, my favorite doctor. No, not that one. No, not that one. <laughs> Dr. Sire. So, Dr. Sire, can you uh, tell me what we've got so far? Yeah, okay, so the picture <laughs> you're looking at is um, what we're going to build today and, and then, you know, dissect a little bit. Um, so, we have the UI and we've got two services sitting behind it, one for the fleet, the trucks, and one for the service locations. And Ashley, why don't I show you what that looks like already because we've been working on it, you might have guessed. Um, actually, this is it, running on Cloud Foundry. Okay, this on is premise, a, right? Our, uh, our it's a yeah, pivotal hosted internal Cloud Foundry, um, and you can see right there's some trucks here, there are blue ones and green ones. Have a guess what that means? No, no idea. Green blue. ones are happy trucks. Uh -huh. Blue ones, it says down here. Look, there, there's something that we need to read about the blue ones, and if they're really bad, they're going to go yellow orange, and red. You know, we did another thing, another keynote, another year with blue-green. I remember that. In Cloud Foundry, <laughs> yeah. That was I a different that. one. OK, so this is real data. That's the story, OK? So this, this fleet service is already developed. It has some data in it. Um, these trucks, they're not actually moving anywhere yet. OK, so come back tomorrow for that. We're going to do the live update service pieces tomorrow. Today, what we're going to do is the service stations. So, Chris, so if these trucks need service, then they need to know where to go. And what we have is a little UI feature that pops up service locations. But this has been developed for us as a stub by the UI team. So the UX team are very good at RentMe. And um, they've, they've done a really bang up job of getting this UI in place. But they haven't got any real data for the service locations. And so that's what we're going to do. You ready? I'm ready if you are. Should we do some estimation? Yeah, because uh, I've got a, we know we have a short keynote tonight, so <laughs> how long do you imagine this will take exactly? Um, five. You, weeks? D days? Where are we? What are we talking about here? Minutes. <laughs> okay, I dare you. <laughs> I double dare you. Depends how much you talk, all right? <laughs> okay. So, so if you can be ten quiet, minutes, ten all right. minutes, twenty. <laughs> we won't hold you to it, right? Okay, Ashley. So um, this is my Spring Source, uh, Spring Tool Suite um, UI. I've already got so the pieces we've already built. I've got them here. The dashboard, uh, the fleet location service is running, and there's a stub for the service location service. 
And also, notice down here, there's a new feature here called the Boot Dashboard. And those services are showing up down here as well. So two of them are running. Um, let me just show you what happens. I can restart or start, <laughs> since it wasn't actually running. Um, the dashboard, and you can see um, the, the console over there. Uh, there are other things I can do here, like I can open in a web browser. And there we go. So it's running locally. It's the same data, basically, as I just showed you on Cloud Foundry. It's the same app. And that's sort of important, because later I'm going to do the Cloud Foundry thing. OK, so let's build the service location service. New Spring Starter project. Fancy wizard. Fancy wizard. This is a yeah. uh, Spring Starter project wizard. Is that, is there other, is, it's part of Spring Tool Suite. What does that actually do? I have no idea. <laughs> it's magic. No, it's, um, it's looking at this thing. <laughs> this is also running on Cloud Foundry, actually, on um, PWS. So this is a little web service with a UI that you can use to generate new projects. Would you say that that's the best place on the web? It's the best place. Would you say that people should bookmark it, keep it under the pillows, <laughs> read it to their children if, it, if in doubt? Yes. OK. That's what I do. <laughs> so I'm going to use the latest stable version of Spring Boot which is M5. Um, right, so we're going to do some web stuff, right? Naturally. REST repository. Yep. Um, what's a repository, Jim? Uh, MongoDB. Is that OK with you? Uh, it's web scale. It's web scale. So is <laughs> dev null. Boom, boom. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm going to bring in Lombok as well. You'll see why in a what's minute. What's Lombok? Oh, Doc? you'll see in a minute. It just saves me from having to write a load of code. I'm a fan already. I'm, yeah, well. OK, so I've got a new project. Um, it's compiling and everything. There's, there it is. It's a Spring Boot application. What was your first clue? Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't do much yet. Um, but I can make it do stuff. I can make it do stuff really quickly. I can say I need a new interface for service locations. And it's a repository. OK. And that will extend. Um, an existing Spring Data interface called Paging and Sorting Repository. There it is. Um, of service locations with ID of type string. OK. Now, this is working. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I need to create that service class, that service location class. It's a domain object, right? So, and in this case, I'm going to store it in Mongo. So it's a document, because Mongo tells me it's a document store. So you're using Spring Data. I'm using you're getting ORM-like facilities for Mongo and other pr technologies. Yep. I'm getting ORM for MongoDB from yeah. Spring Data. All right, so that's you know the bare bones of a service location. Uh, there's some important stuff that we're going to want to do later with um, geolocation. That's why I've chosen Mongo, by the way. Because I, I want see. to do. I know that you're going to want to do this. You're going to want to know where is the closest. I was told by some very reputable, trustworthy people at a golf game that they had a ninety thousand dollar <laughs> product we could use instead for geolocation. Oh, do you think that's this interesting? Is, they didn't. They didn't promise theirs was web scale, though. <laughs> so. Well, let's just try this, shall okay. we? Okay. See how okay, it goes. Okay, fine. Okay, so we have a point which is um, a latitude, longitude location, and we have importantly a geospatial index for that thing, so we can search on it later. Um, OK, so I added fields, um, and I also need to have getters and setters. So I'm going to do that quickly like that. That's the Lombok. Oh, I don't together. write getters and setters anymore. And there's a bit more there as well. And I've also got um, JSON annotations so that it will serialize and deserialize. So you, you don't get to just hand wave through that. What is that going to do, at data? At data, it well, actually, look. It, Look at the code. Pri private fields. Yes. You get. Getters. And that's a code generator then, or some sort of getters compiler and uh, processor? I don't know. It's magic. Magic. Sorcery. Yeah, sorcery, exactly. So there's a couple of things I need to do here just to finish this off. It's a rest repository resource. And I know because the guys who wrote the stub told me <laughs> um, they need a special hypermedia link called locations. What's hypermedia, Dave? I don't know. It's magic. 
I'll show it to you. Okay. All right, I'll show it to you. There's probably a talk about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, oh, probably, yeah, 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 probably. Who's, gi be, who's giving that? Ollie? Yeah, probably. Okay, um, I believe I can already run that, but I'm just going to finish one little thing off here. So I've got a config file. What do I need a config file for? Well, I need to give this thing a name. Oops, bring application name. There we go. Equals service location service uh, server dot port. I like the auto completion. I like the auto completion. That's powerful. And this works for both dot properties and YAML files, right? And YAML. Oh, nice. I believe they can do it in IntelliJ as well. And NetBeans. And NetBeans. For the one, for the one guy using uh, <laughs> every every country I go, every place, every city, there's always this one guy who follows me around using NetBeans. <laughs> it's the same one. I'm sure of it. <laughs> Is he here? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Show yourself. Fine. Yeah, he didn't. Well, anyway, it works <laughs> there as well. OK, so what I'm going to do is I've got this app. I'm going to shut down the stub. And I'm going to start up the new Mongo service. All right. And we'll see it starting up really quickly on port 9001. OK, so let's just have a look at port 9. Oh, actually, you know what I can do? I can right click on him. Open in web browser. There we go. Oh, that's convenient. Convenient. One Another stop shop, that boot dashboard. Hypermedia. See? Oh, metadata then. Da da. All right, so what the UI is going to do is look for these links and follow the one called locations. Right? I like that. You like that. All right. Um, OK, we're ready to ship it. We should, uh, well, well, we, no. we uh, should run the docs. I mean, we should oh, have docs. docs. All right, yeah, actually, we need to have some tests, maybe. Right. You're uh, yeah. Sa quickly and safely, okay. Dave. <laughs> well, luckily, the guys who wrote the stubs did a bang-up job on that as well. So they wrote some integration tests. And they wrote those for us so that we could verify that when we've written a service, we know it works. All right, so I'm just going to copy those tests over from the stub. And they were using a tool um, written by a friend of ours called Andy Wilkinson. Who's in the, in the audience? Please stand up, Andy. He's a Reddit resident mad scientist. <laughs> oh, there he is. He's the one winning. So this is called Spring Rest Docs. Rest Docs. And that's a really cool thing that lets you um, do this. OK, so that's my stub service test. And I'm just going to turn that into a real service test by changing the config file name, right? And I've got two of them, so I could do the same thing with that one. And so this is the story, right? Let's um, have a look at a little bit of how they're implemented. Not, not going to go into too much detail here. So you've got, um, here's a mock MVC test, right? So I'm doing a get on the home page, and making some assertions, expecting the res result. And I'm saying, document it. And what that does is create some nice, pretty HTML documentation that, so the people who can see in this service are going to want to see, you know, so you've got the How test and the documentation in the same place. The What's the benefit of that? Well, if one changes, then the other one automatically changes with it, doesn't it? Oh, you know, you know, we, as you know, we at Pivotal are big fans of Agile, and we like working software over comprehensive documentation. But this is this is this both. Looks one. like I get both in this case. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to run the tests. I need we need to um, finish this off, don't we? Run as JUnit test. OK, uh -oh. I've got one green and one blue. What does blue mean? Blue is bad, right? Red. Um, so OK, there's something. a reason for that. Because it's testing an endpoint that I haven't implemented. OK, this, <laughs> this is that famous geolocation query I was telling you I about. I was wondering why you brought yeah, in Mongo. Yeah, see, now so. I remember. Right, so we need to find the first service station by location near something. That's the, um, the way that we, so it, that we sounds say Sounds complicated. This. What does that look like? In it's Actual really, code. really complicated. Watch. Page of service location. Find first by location near point location pageable page. That's almost all I need to do. I just need to add, I think, a param annotation just to say that that's the name of the parameter. 
Okay. Okay. So I just added a new method to my um, repository interface by because of the form of the name, and actually I think I can even do some. Um, I was going to say I could do some spring, uh, some auto completion on that. I think that does work if, if I do it the right way, but I'll skip over that. We can edit that out in the YouTube bit. Can't yeah, we? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, maybe that test will work now. Let's see. Only one way to find out. In production. Hooray! Hooray! All right. Now, should we ship it? Can we ship it? You know, uh, you know, Dave. We at Pivotal, we love production. We care about production a lot. I don't know if you people realize this, but around the office there are people looking at brochures for production. Production is the happiest place on earth, much better than Disneyland. So can we go to production, please? Not yet. Oh. All right. <laughs> Remember, I told you about that um, documentation that we just generated. Yeah. So you didn't quite see that happen yet, so oh. I'm just going to show you. Because the guys who wrote the stubs, this is really clever of them, they, they wrote some documentation as well, and they packaged it up inside the jar file for the stub. So I'm just going to add that as a dependency, all right? And oh. then when I, um, I'm going to need to restart it, restart that service that's running locally, you will see some magic. You mean spring? Yeah. All right, this is it, wasn't it? So remember, it was JSON, that now it's huge. a little browser. OK, I can browse the locations. I can find all the metadata. Um, there's some other stuff here as well, which is, oops, docs service. Oops, when I spell it right. So the, doc the service, the documentation for this service Whoa. is, here we go, nice so HTML. Somebody wrote the. Um, so how, much, how many reams of HTML paragraphs did somebody have to write to get all those words in there? Oh, nobody wrote HTML. Oh, what it's is that then? This thing called ASCII doctor. That's markedly better than what we had before. Good we stuff. We all love it, right? So that's what we use to write documentation now. OK, so that's there. And also, actually, um, since I'm here, there, is some, there are some other endpoints here that came for free. So not the ones that I wrote, but the ones that came with Spring Boot. And uh. um, we're going to use those to help us to get into production, or stay in production. Can we go to production now? Can we go to production now? Can we no, go to production well, now? Almost, but now that you got this service running, the UI is going to need to talk to it. And I think some other stuff's going to want to talk to it later, oh, too. Oh, yeah, right. And we don't really want to configure like a host address or a URL or anything to oh, get right, to yeah. it. So we want these things to be registered so they can be found. So I'm running this here locally, and I've just hard coded these oh, right. numbers and stuff like that. Yeah, I want to. We don't want to do that in production. I want to do that properly, don't I? So how do I do that? At enable discovery client. How about that? Yep. Yeah. What does that do? Reach for the at enable. What does that do? I don't know. It's magic. <laughs> it's true. Well, true. Not a very good answer. What does it do? That will um, enable this application when it comes up to contact the service registry to say, I am the service location service. And here I am running on port 9001. I see. And so anybody who wants to contact it can do it by name instead of by random number. So in a cloud environment where services tend to be ephemeral, sometimes they come to life, sometimes they <coughs> spring to life <laughs> and then die at all times, does that give you the ability to like Yeah, it's going to work. It's going to be fine. To Watch. topology changes? It's going to be fine. Watch. OK, so um, you might have noticed here in this dashboard I had local apps. I've got some non-local apps with a little cloud symbol on them. And those are actually running in Cloud Foundry. OK, so I'm just going to uh, log into that. You didn't see that? You can't see my keyboard, can you? Well. <laughs> OK, so those are the apps that are running remotely on Cloud Foundry. I already showed you the UI, right? And there's the service location service, which is the stub. And I'm going to replace it with the new one. So how do I do that? Drag and drop. There we go. So he's something. on his way to production. He says, do you want to replace the existing service? Yes. Of course I do. OK. And it's going to show me the logs here. And while that's launching, it'll take a minute. Um, I'll hand over to Scott, and he can show us yep. what's going to happen at the other end. So I'm that? worried about switch over to my screen, and we'll show that. Scott, I'm worried about once we get, we know that there's a huge demand for this application. I'm worried about 
the traffic, the deluge of traffic. Are we going to be able to scale this thing? Yeah. And okay, how do we You shouldn't have to worry about that, Josh. I'll show you that. Um, so this is uh, an app manager dashboard that comes with uh, Cloud Foundry. Uh, so here we can see the apps that have been deployed just like Dave was showing them in STS in his boot dashboard. So I've got three out here running now. I'll refresh. This should show that um, service location service is just now coming up because Dave just redeployed it. It's alive. It's coming alive. <laughs> um, so we have those three applications running in Cloud Foundry. We also have these services that we've created. Uh, so we have one that's a config server. Uh, we have one that's a Eureka service registry. We had those all on the slide a minute ago. MySQL, MongoDB, and RabbitMQ are the services we have out there right now. Do you have other services as well? Oh, we got lots of other services. Uh, I can show you this marketplace page here. Um, so you can see we've got the MySQL, React, Rabbit, Redis. These three here are ones that we've built on top of Spring Cloud. So we have our circuit breaker, config server, and service registry. So it makes it dead simple to uh, create those servers and have your application connect to them. And then we have Gemfire, Neo4j, uh, Neo4j MongoDB. Yeah, this, this is a demo environment, so some of these are actual production services. A few of them are like in developer stage that we're testing with right now. But we've got all those available that we could create and use in our applications. Um, so service location services back up and running again now. Uh, but you were wondering about scale. So let's talk about scale for a minute here. Um, I'm going to click on this dashboard app. Um, I can click on its URL and actually see that it's running in Cloud Foundry just like Dave showed. And there's all our trucks. Um, I can see some other stuff about this application. Um, we were testing earlier, so um, you can see that we've been messing around with scaling on the dashboard already. Um, I can see that I've bound this application to these services. So here's config server again in Eureka. We can see that it's bound to those, so it's using them. Um, it's going to be using Eureka to find the service location service, for example. So when you bind a service, you're taking a, an existing instance and giving it a connection to the app. So yep. theoretically, multiple apps could share one service. Or yeah, the service is basically telling the app how to connect to it and any credentials that it might need to connect anything like that. That's basically what happens when you bind an app to a service. Um, and the application could have one or more URLs associated with it. And then we can actually view logs for an application as it's running in Cloud Foundry in so here. Is that for all of the instances? Because I don't want to have to log into each node yep, or something it's for like all that. of them. Yep, it's for all of them. And you can drain these logs out of Cloud Foundry into an external system where you can capture them and do a lot of analysis and stuff like that. Uh, but this app manager just gives us a real quick view of what's been going on in logs. Uh, so we've got one instance of this application running now. I'm just going to quickly tell it we want to have four. We don't ha you know, this is a keynote. We don't actually have a lot of time to wait for virtual machines to spin up. Yeah, uh, that's the good thing about Cloud Foundry, though, is for each of these new app instances that we're starting, we're not creating a VM. You know, if you create a VM, drop a host OS on it, drop maybe a, a web container and your app bits, all that takes minutes. Uh, but we don't want to wait minutes because it's a keynote. So uh, what Cloud Foundry does is it just creates containers within a pool of already running VMs. And we took an image or a snapshot of the first application instance that we pushed, and we're just taking that snapshot creating new containers and redeploying the app into those containers, and it takes seconds, as you saw. So now we have four instances of the application running instead of just one. Wow. Um, and I can prove to you that there's really three running. Oh. Um, because what Cloud Foundry does, since uh, you see we have one URL bound to this application, uh, so if I keep hitting this URL, um, I'm getting randomly chosen instances of that application. So the Cloud Foundry front end is doing load balancing of all the instances that I've started up. Uh, but they're all going to look the same because we're all stateless and um, everything's being load balanced. But I'm going to show you here. This is the Spring Boot actuator endpoint that uh, Dave showed. Uh, this one is slash env, so it shows you all the environment variables in your app. And uh, Spring Boot will automatically parse out a couple of environment variables that Cloud Foundry sets for your application to expose things about the platform to the application. And they're all under this VCAP heading. Uh, so we're going to look at this one that's called vcap.application.instanceindex. So this is just an ordinal from 0 to 3 since we started four instances, of uh, which of those uh, app instances I hit. So I'm going to do a refresh here. And now I'm running instance 1. I'll do a refresh again. Now I'm hitting instance 2. So that just kind of proves that we're doing this load balancing among the instances that we've started up. Automatic. Automatically. Cloud Foundry just does that for you. Um, so we can scale up the dashboard front end app. We can also 
um, scale up any of these services that we ran. So, um, and we can do the scaling uh, through this app manager. We can actually do it through the CLI or there's a REST API you can call to do it with. Uh, and I'm gonna, before we scale up this next one, bring up this uh, service registry dashboard. So again, this is part of what we got with the uh, Spring Cloud services for Pivotal Cloud Foundry. And we can see in this Eureka dashboard, we can also see here that we now have the four dashboard instances running. And we have one instance of this fleet location service. Uh, so just for the fun of it, let's bring up a CLI. And I'm just gonna go get, uh, through the CLI, I'm gonna tell it to list all the apps that are running in the space. I'm gonna see exactly the same thing I saw in the app manager. We've got uh, three applications running here, dashboard, service location service, and fleet location service. So I'm gonna take the name of this one and do CF scale that service instance, or that service name, and tell it I want four of those. So exactly the same thing is gonna happen. Cloud Foundry is just gonna take that image and create three new containers and scale it up. And it's gonna do the same load balancing, but in this case, um, when a service registers, it can choose to either register by its URL, in which case the dashboard will be calling the fleet location service by URL, and Cloud Foundry will be doing that same load balancing that it just did for the front end. But a service can also be configured to register itself by IP address and port if your uh, Cloud Foundry is set up to allow that, in which case the Spring Cloud client side load balancing will, so will take over and do all that load balancing ah, instead. Get both choices. Oh, look, yep, they're coming up too. Choice. Yep. So we've got from one to three, now we've got four up and running. Uh, so we can see that in the Eureka uh, dashboard that we've got four instances registered now. Uh, if we refresh this, we'll show four instances. And we did this manually here, but I could have connected this to the autoscaler. Yeah, we also have an autoscaler service that will scale based on a time schedule or based on the amount of load, CPU load coming into an app, so you can do that automatically as well. Or again, since there's a REST API, you could write your own automation against that if you wanted to. Sounds workable. It's Sounds nice, huh? very convenient. Yeah. So we'll be okay. To, we'll be able, be able to meet the demand tomorrow. Yep, we should. Um, and the other thing you asked about was how do we make sure they stay up? Yeah. Um, so Cloud what Foundry. About, what if what if we get too much traffic? Well, Dave's code will just work if we get too much traffic. That's not a problem. But we if, you, if you kill, and all if that you stuff. kill instances, what happens? Yeah. yeah. So we'll we'll uh, show you what happens if uh, there's a really bad bug in something that kills an application instance. The doctor so doesn't make bugs. I know. That's why this is so hard to demo. <laughs> um, we had to introduce one. Yep. So another Spring Boot actuator endpoint we have is an endpoint called Shutdown, which isn't enabled by default in a Spring Boot app because you don't want somebody just hitting an endpoint and shutting down your app, right? Um, but we have enabled it for this demo, so I'm going to get the URL for this application, and I'm just going to do a quick curl on it. So that's the route for the app, and I'm just going to add shutdown to the end of that. Don't try this at home. Yeah, don't try this to this app while we're doing a keynote either. <laughs> so that ran, and we get a very nice, polite little message very from Spring polite. Boot saying, shutting Aww. down, bye, see ya. Um, and we can see over here in the service registry now, Oh, we only have three. So one of them died. That was uh, picked up by Eureka because it quit seeing a heartbeat from one of them. It was also picked up by Cloud Foundry uh, because it's constantly pinging every app that's running and making sure it's up. Um, so you know, we're back up to four again now. So um, when Cloud Foundry detects that an instance isn't running, it knows there should be four, but if there's only three, it's going to figure that out and just create a new container just like it did with scale and start a new one again. Um, so that new one has been started back up already, um, and this is going to take a little bit longer for it to get registered with Eureka. So and we can show that in here, too. It actually... The platform will wear, wear the pager, so to speak. Basically, yep. And in this events uh, tab, we even got a message saying that an instance of the app has crashed. And I don't, if boot put something in the logs, then we would see that in the logs also. Let's see some ASCII art. <coughs> I love the ASCII art run. <laughs> Josh's favorite feature. Yeah. So now we see we have all four instances back up and running right. again. So zero is what came down before. And in Eureka, we have four instances running again. So well, I feel healthy. much better. So we're all about Josh making you feel good. We, we can get to production with this, right? We, we're we're in production. There. We're almost there, aren't we? I think we've got just a few more things we need to take care of. Tomorrow? Yeah, sounds like fun. Tomorrow. Tomorrow we're going to... Well, I noticed that those trucks aren't really doing much, are they? 
Trucks are not moving yet. And, and I also would like a nice way to manipulate some of the environment features, some of the actuator information oh, that's from, a, good idea. from a web application. Maybe a nice UI. Yeah. OK. So to, let's ask tomorrow, we're going to ask Mark Fisher and Graham Roche to join us here and help us uh, round out the features, and we can get this done and yeah, into production. Yeah, that'll be fun. Uh, with that, I wanted to invite the one, the only, the man who needs no introduction, Jürgen Holler, Spring Framework Lead, uh, to join us on stage. Great demo, guys, for a start. Is this on? Can I have a, a yeah, selfie? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't work without it, right? Nope, it's not, it's not really a, a thing. Okay, ready? One, two. Spring, no, nope. spring, lane. Hey, come on. You, spring. Yeah. Uh, I already you, thought you were losing it, right? <laughs> By not taking a proper selfie. Oh, uh, I was. It's a springy um, with you. You know, it's different. Where, do we have the um, clicker? Here you go, sir. Yeah, just the first. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Um, oh, hi, everybody. So uh, we um, split up this keynote for the for the demo parts, the demo and. Uh, that, that great storyline is going to continue tomorrow, right? Same spring time. Uh, yeah, same time. Same spring channel. Um, so I have the pleasure and the honor of wrapping up today's, tonight's keynote with uh, a bit of a different angle, which is the spring frame agreement, right? Something uh, very dear to our heart. Of course, we uh, um, have uh, already entered uh, the late stages of 2015 here. We are already planning towards 2016, since quite a few of our efforts, of our ongoing efforts at this point, um, we're already working towards, um, well, some stuff that's coming next year. And uh, I'm going to share a little bit of what we're working towards here in uh, this remaining section. The, the plan, the basic plan, is decomposed into two phases, right? We have a Spring Framework 4.3 coming up, which is the final feature release in the, um, in the Photodex line. So a continuation of our current development stream, following up on 4.2, similar iteration, um, so it's going to be another nine to 10 months after 4.2 here. And this is going to be the last feature release that's based on the Spring Framework 4 system requirements. So this is still a release that works on JDK 6, 7, and 8, works on Server 2.5 plus, et cetera, et cetera. So no change in the system requirements. Um, it's wrapping up some of the efforts that we've been working on in 4.1, 4.2. Uh, there are some further refinements in the core dependency injection model plant. A um, couple of, well, oldies but goodies. We are listening to uh, what you guys report on our issue tracker. So we are actually collecting issues uh, that kind of have a little bit of a coherent uh, uh, arrangement around them and are trying to wrap things up for 4.3 here. Um, a particular um, recent work stream um, is also worth, worth noting here. It's about our use of annotations and the use of composable annotations. As you're probably aware, in Springland, uh, we allow you to compose your own annotations. So you can take our annotations, create your own, uh, use ours as meta annotations on your annotations, and create, well, convenience annotations, annotations that you name yourselves, uh, that do exactly what you want them to do, that have a purpose within your own code, within your own architecture. That's all great, of course, and it's a great asset in Spring itself that we allow you to compose annotations. But we're also starting to um, wrap up kind of the out-of-the-box arrangement with some pre-composed annotations, some specifically purposed annotations um, that are nothing more than just a combination, a composition of uh, core annotations in Spring, but are pretty commonly used. So there are some of those already. Just uh, think about the at rest controller annotation, for example, which is just a combination of at controller and at response body, really. But we already provided out of the box uh, for you at this very point. Some, some such annotations, further annotations uh, along those lines are going to come your way in 4.3. And we already have a little bit of a uh, kind of an R&D project, uh, Spring Composed, side by side, 
well, we are trying some of those annotations and with, we already uh, anticipate feedback. But it's all going to go into Photo 3 here. And, of course, we are open for further feature requests, right? If there's anything you'd like us to do in the Photo.x line still, ideally in things that are actually doable in the Photo 3 iteration, right? But if there's low-hanging fruit, some things that you feel would complete the picture um, with not too much effort and time-wise, we are happy to roll it into the Photo 3 plan still. So this plan also leaves a little bit of, of room um, for requests that are yet to come. So that's, uh, concretely speaking, uh, targeting the March-April period next year. So uh, expect a release candidate in March 2016 and GA in the April-May timeframe next year. There's already quite concrete planning towards uh, the next step. We are actually planning towards a Spring Framework 5 generation already. Spring Framework 5 um, is, of course, a, a little bit of a more major revision, right? So there's a couple of things set in stone already. We're going to have a Java 8 baseline. This is a pretty important enabler for not only Spring Framework itself, but for the entire Spring ecosystem, for the Spring Data projects, for Spring Boot. Um, so all the associated projects would also have a major revision towards a Java 8 baseline, where everything is Java 8 based internally. The, our entire code base can make use of Java 8 features, Java 8 source code style, and even more importantly, our core contracts, the core APIs and the core SPIs can make use of Java 8 types, which is a pretty important enabler. Think about our API and SPI interfaces in Spring. Um, we can start using, for example, optional stream uh, or some other Java 8 specific types in the most core interfaces we have in Springland. So that, that's pretty important stuff. And we're making some further use, uh, which I'm going to talk about in just, just a minute. Um, so baseline-wise, Java 8 plus, that's what it's going to be. But it's also about JDK 9. JDK 9 is scheduled for release next September. Let's be optimistic and trust Oracle that it's actually going to be delivered. But there's a very concrete date, September 22nd. Just let's, let's expect that to happen. And that's perfect because our timing works out here. We're going to pick this up for Spring Framework 5 basically from day one onwards. So the first Spring Framework 5 milestone that you're going to get next year is already going to be built on JDK 9 release candidates. And the Spring Framework 5 release candidate line uh, is expected to build on JDK 9 GA. JDK 9 uh, might not be the most radical release in terms of the source code um, style that you're using to write your, uh, to write your Java code in. Um, but it, it does deliver some really significant changes at the runtime level. So the JDK itself is restructured. You know, there's quite a bit of stuff happening, jigsaw coming. Um, from our perspective, we're going to make sure that we are embracing JDK 9, that JDK 9 is a first-class citizen in the spring world, that everything that you get from us right after JDK 9 GA is perfectly well adapted to JDK 9 if you choose to use it at that time already. So J Java 8 baseline, of course, perfectly fine. But if you're ambitious, if you're using JDK 9, you'll be able to make the best possible use of all the functionality in there, from the new HTTP clients on to uh, all the runtime features in JDK 9. All right. Um, talking about the HTTP clients, we also have a general HTTP 2 focus these days. As you might be aware, we're already starting to have some dedicated sessions on the use of HTTP 2 in kind of the Java, the Spring, uh, the wider Spring and Java world. This is a general focus of ours. Um, of course, not a problem to solve on our own. We are embracing technologies that are already ambitious uh, to have HTTP 2 support from the Jetties, Undertoes, and Tomcats of this world to the HTTP client libraries like Apache, Apache HTTP components and the upcoming new JDK 9 HTTP client. So this is all going to be a complete picture by, by the time that we are releasing this. 
The current uh, target is uh, actually Q4 2016. I'm not exactly sure why it says Q2 here. Um, a first milestones plan for Q2, so just to um, double check that. Yeah, that's probably coming over from the 4.3 um, timeline. Uh, a first milestone is planned for the June period at least. Next year, might flip over to July. Release candidates around September. And uh, GA in Q4, as far as we can tell right now, right? It's very dependent, of course, on you guys blessing our release candidates and saying, this is great, ship it. Um, but it's also dependent on a couple of you know, third parties getting their job done, like Oracle releasing JDK 9, according to the current plan, right? If something radical happens, we might rethink a little. Um, you might remember how we did it with Spring Framework 4.0 and JDK 8 at the time. We might have to do something along those lines again for Spring Framework 5. But in the best possible world, right, in the ideal world out there, everything's going to work out just fine from a timing perspective. So let's forget about um, the timing for, the, for a moment. Uh, let's focus on a specific area that we are also spending a lot of energy on at the moment. It's about reactive architectures and reactive processing. In Spring 5, we are going to introduce comprehensive support for reactive architectures, enabling you to build reactive architectures. So we're going to go the extra mile uh, we're going to have first-class support for I.O. streams with back pressure, for the Reactive Streams initiative. Um, we're, going, we're even going as far as um, designing a, uh, an HTTP endpoint processing model based on Reactive Streams, um, so kind of a Reactive Web Processing Engine along the lines of Spring MVC with a lot of familiarity in terms of the endpoint style, the programming model, the use of annotations. But with a first class uh, arrangement towards um, reactive processing. So you're going to find this across the framework in some form. There's already an early version of this in the form of the Spring Reactive R&D project. And we have a couple of talks even at this show in terms of uh, uh, introducing you to uh, this kind of thinking, this kind of architecture. We are going to do this in a very pragmatic fashion, so we're going to take, um, well, the ideas and the concepts that you already know, we're kind of, kind of going to wrap them up uh, towards uh, some reactive concepts, but depending on your choice of uh, data stores and other infrastructure components, you can also, of course, compose a uh, complete reactive processing architecture across your system. If you happen to use a reactive data store driver, um, it may come all the way through from the HTTP endpoints down to uh, the data stores. And Spring is going to be right there to connect the pieces for you and provide a first-class programming model for it. So um, I've already mentioned it, that there are a couple of talks. So towards the reactive angle, there's uh, introduction to reactive programming coming up tomorrow at 10.30 which is highly recommended as an introduction to the, to the problem space, right? And the whole reactive thinking behind it. The um, reactive web apps session on Thursday is uh, even more concrete and might actually provide a sneak, a sneak peek towards some of the concrete efforts that we're working on um, in Spring Framework 5. As a more general session on the latest in the Spring Framework programming model. Um, I highly recommend my own session tomorrow that I do together with Stefan. Uh, tomorrow morning, the modern Java component design with Spring Framework 4.2. <laughs> um, sorry. Um, so it's actually 4.2 uh, updated, of course. Um, where I'm going to just highlight the current state of the art in terms of the programming model design with plenty of source examples and half of the session doing live demos, uh, applying those design concepts um, to some, some concrete problems and concrete endpoint models out there. All right, so much for the Spring Framework um, outlook in, in all brevity here. There's one more thing I'd like to cover today. Um, and that's JUnit 5, or as they tend to call it in the campaign, JUnit Lander. 
you might be aware that uh, JUnit is a little, well, stuck to some degree in uh, the, the JUnit 4 arrangement that, that it is in right now. It really needs a little bit of heavy lifting towards a more Java 8 oriented version of JUnit that really embraces Java 8, Java 8 concepts, lambdas in particular. So the JUnit core development team largely contributors, um, not really uh, corporate, corporately back there, uh, decided to run a crowdfunding campaign. The JUnit Lambda campaign, still ongoing. And I have the pleasure today to announce that uh, Pivotal is actually sponsoring JUnit uh, quite seriously. We uh, participate through two channels, because the campaign actually allows us to do that. Uh, we donate developer time, so we donate six weeks of uh, senior developer time on our end towards JUnit 5, which are going to be spent on actually improving the JUnit core and the JUnit integration contracts. And at the same time, we also donate a, we participate with a cash donation of 5,000 euros um, towards the actual crowdfunding campaign, which the JUnit team itself is free to use any way that it pleases in terms of uh, the developer focus that they choose for it. Of course, this is a crowdfunding campaign. So everybody, you, uh, you're of course able to uh, donate yourself. Uh, why not uh, convince your company to do a little donation or do a little donation on your own? Um, this is really an important signal. JUnit is arguably the most widely used Java open source project out there. It's, it's just everywhere, right? Um, it's really important that this piece here gets proper, some proper love, some proper upgrading towards a Java 8 uh, plus world. From our end, the timelines actually align with Spring Framework 5. So the idea is that we are going to immediately pick up everything that's done in JUnit here, in JUnit 5, and are going to have immediate support for it, immediate integration with it in the Spring Framework 5 timeline. So if all goes well, you know, like, <laughs> uh, we're going to see how well the timelines work out in the end. But we are definitely going to do everything we can to make it happen, both on the JUnit side and on the Spring Framework 5 side. All right. So much for JUnit. Well, let's wrap up the, uh, the keynote this way. What you've seen today is, of course, plenty of stuff, plenty of uh, um, pointers to follow up on. Um, that really presents Spring as what it is today, these days. Uh, it is the richest and deepest framework you could possibly use to build cloud-native applications, covering so many angles, uh, both, of course, on the development side and in connection with Cloud Foundry, in particular with Cloud Foundry, also on the operations side. It really is a very complete, very comprehensive picture, and it's not, a, it's not done, right? It's an actively evolved uh, arrangement, we are going to continue to do the best we can uh, to just adapt to the problems that you are having or will be having. And 2016 is going to be a particularly important year where we are going to wrap up uh, many things in, uh, in new major releases in particular here. All right. Well, thanks for your attention. At this point, I'd like to, to welcome Peter back up on stage for some closing remarks, right? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Let's Thanks. have a round for these guys. Thank you very much, Jurgen. And uh, rent me application team. Yes. What's up? He wants a photo. Oh, selfie time. Sorry, hold on one second. <laughs> okay. Apparently. Yes, and I also want you to get a photo with us. While Josh is preparing for this, I just want to say that I have the unfortunate responsibility of standing between you and alcohol. Um, <clears throat> so I'm uh, going to try to make this quick. Um, just want to very quickly mention, could you uh, click me to the next one, please? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, that uh, we are launching some uh, cloud-native workshops. So the URL there up on the screen. Um, if uh, you are interested in having a day-long hands-on engagement with us, uh, we just picked up a bunch more evangelists from Oracle. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, suddenly our delivery capability, yeah, yes, exactly. And uh, maybe even a few more. <clears throat> um, but um, 
if, you, if you're interested in this, um, we are, seriously, we are expanding our delivery capability, so um, it's not all gonna fall on, on poor Josh Long here, um, who already spends a lot of time in an airplane. But visit us at that URL on the screen, and uh, fill out the form, and we'll check it out, give you a call back, uh, or an email back, and kind of suss out what you're looking for, what your, uh, what your company or what your team needs, and see if uh, you know, we have availability with the evangelist fleet. Uh, to come out and spend a day with you and get hands-on and get dirty with this stuff. So, um, with that, I'd like to uh, do a selfie and call up uh, David uh, to kick off the alcohol from Target. Um, Dan Dalma, if you would please come up to the stage from Target, um, and you can send our, our good folk here off to some food and beverage. Okay. This is All right. A, this is a, a super important use case here. Ready? <sighs> No. Nice, Do thank you. Doctor, I need to Okay, uh, Dan, are you here? Excellent, please, come on up. Okay. Hey, buddy. Wow! <laughs> Whoa! Good to see you, man. Good to see you. Hey, Dan. Selfie? Yeah, well, oh. actually, can, can I use your phone this time? I'm out of space. <laughs> <laughs> He's got so many pictures. Yeah. Too many selfies. I know, yeah, literally. <laughs> it's too many amazing people here. <laughs> <laughs> I, want the, I want to get one with the four of us. Can you help? Hey, you! You've got one of those non-selfie cameras. Come here. <laughs> <laughs> what is that even for? We have iPhones. You want to take one with that, too? Yeah, just get it the four. Uh, wait, I can't, I can't math too good. One, two, three. Wow, I'm sorry. This is taking too long. Awkward. Yeah. I know. Okay. Ah. Okay. Nope. Uh, close enough. Okay. Close All enough. Right. It's dark in Thank here. Thank you. Thanks for the drinks, man. <laughs> Mike, check. Is that better? Yeah. Okay, all right. So um, uh, please excuse the, my awkward stride. Um, I had surgery a couple months ago on my ankle, and uh, so now they have me wearing this thing for the next part of the recovery. So. Um, you'll probably see me clomping around the conference because there's no spring in this boot. But <laughs> to, that way more applause than I was expecting at that. So thank you for that. Um, and I had to get that out of my system, so you will not hear that joke for the rest of the week. So. Um, uh, my name is Dan Dalma. Um, I'm a lead developer on my team, um, and I, in the spring, I'm going to be celebrating 10 years with Target. Um, Target has, is very pleased to sponsor um, Spring One this year, and we've brought a very friendly delegation uh, to be a part of this community. Um, so Target has realized that to compete and win in our industry, um, we have to level up our business processes and use of technology and hire the best talent. Um, we're rapidly moving away from the tools from the vendors that supplied us those in the past and towards more um, uh, faster evolving tools like Git, Jenkins, Jira, Cassandra, Kafka, a, a bunch of others. And those are, those are technologies that Target did not have just a couple of years ago. Um, we're investing heavily in automate, uh, infrastructure automation and treating configuration as code. Um, what, gone are the days of the waterfall uh, uh, project cycle. Um, my team and several others have converted to a uh, agile model where of rapid prototyping, and um, much faster release cycles. Uh, so when bug fixes and new features have been verified in stage, they can go to production right away. Um, so uh, um, OK, so it, it's, uh, I'll, I'll clean this up, because we, you know, we all know what's coming next. So I just want to tell you that it's, it's a very exciting time to be a developer at Target. And I would encourage you to visit the Target table and find out how Target is modernizing to become a more innovative and faster moving player in our space. So with that, um, let's start drinking. <laughs> <laughs>